Uh, let me start with you, Hans. If I could ask for a little bit of silence in the back. Pssst. Thank you very much, and uh, pleasure to be here uh, again. Um, I think lucrative would be an understatement. Um, we're talking about a $4.2 trillion Pssst. business, according to the ICC. Um, according to the OECD, it is more in the half a trillion. Um, and that's maybe already one of the reasons why we should regulate it. If, uh, if we have a gap in definition of a global problem at that dimension, and we can't narrow it down in less than 3.1 trillion, which is more or less double than all defense budgets of the world combined, I think we have a serious problem there. And I think legislation, to a certain extent, Maybe I can talk about that a little bit later, plays an absolute crucial role in the fight against counterfeiting and illicit trade. But as I said, to a certain extent, we'll come back to that. Very hopefully. interesting. Uh, Sergey, what do you think? Uh, why should we actually fight illicit trade when it's such a, you know, booming business? Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think uh, we as business, we are, we are, we are doing business, we should protect ourselves because uh, the city, the city trade uh, steal from us. Uh, business needs to, to have some like uh, protection and they also ruin our authority because uh, they sell like our goods. Uh, they are not real. They have uh, fake goods, uh, fake food, these uh, bad things. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really big, big thing that we should protect. You run a company that is called Synthetics. So, could you um, please story. tell a, a little bit more about uh, about the business uh, that you're running? So, we are doing software development, and actually, uh, in our company, we are, we help our clients. They come to us with ideas, with prototypes, with uh, any like uh, plans. We help them to implement these plans. We help them to achieve their goals. Finally, they have products, and sometimes these products. Uh, uh, this combination of physical goods plus software. So software helps to protect and to do a lot of solutions to, to, to fight with illicit trade, to help to, to protect somehow. And uh, tell our audience what type of illicit trade you're fighting. Uh, we fight with, first of all, digital illicit trade, like licensing, like, uh, people steal media content, people steal software. We also fight with, Ill with illicit trade. Uh, for example, uh, that's we have a client whose name is under NDA, but we help them to build assembly line that protects, that creates set of uh, different levels of protections for their goods. That's medical goods. Uh, they need to be 100% protected. So traders and clients, uh, they come to, <coughs> they receive their pills and medicine. Mm -hmm. They can check and make sure that they have goods that are legal mm -hmm. because uh, in illegal goods uh, in medical market it's a huge market so we it's help them to very protect dangerous. yeah by software solution absolutely so if i keep playing a uh, devil's advocate right uh, why should um, business actually care and fight illicit trade Hello, everybody. Uh, Boris Konsevoy, Intetix, uh, president of Intetix. Um, as Serge uh, told, we actually um, fighting with, uh, uh, let's say, violation of intellectual property, first of all. And it's like probably big, big, big part of uh, uh, illicit trade. Uh, in our case, actually, uh, uh, let's say that in, in any case like of illicit trade, it's actually a very good gain, uh, 4.3 trillion, uh, but it's uh, very short term. Let's say that you cannot build a sustainable business, you cannot build a sustainable life based on something illegal, and actually you're stealing. It's like you build your own house and then like share with a stranger from the street just because like he wants it. Uh, so, again, so it's like it's, it's uh, probably lucrative, but again, so it does not work long term. 
So uh, we have just our last panelist uh, joining us as well, and he's Andrew Howard, CEO of Kudelski Security. Um, I know Kudelski a little bit. Um, I've interviewed your CEO, your boss, uh, uh, at the last year's WEF. And of course, you're very involved in software and IT uh, security. And the question to the panelists uh, is, um, why business should actually care about um, illicit trade. So from your point of view, what is your take? Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, obviously, I'm Andrew Howard, CEO of Kodelsky Security. We work primarily with firms that are trying to protect their software or hardware or predominantly their consumables from being manufactured or traded illicitly. Um, and they should care because it's often meaning lost profit. Uh, whenever those consumables are made by someone else or traded illegally, uh, that, that tends to be lost, lost profit for our clients. So. When we work with them, this is very much focused on business, business case protection, business platform protection, keep their business legitimate and keep their business alive. Um, many times on products, particularly in mass produced hardware, the, the margins are very thin. So you bring in those products that are illegally developed, illegally consumed, illegally traded. And, um, those margins can often shrink to zero once litigation gets involved or just flat out from the pricing. So it's an important market for us and it's an important uh, capability for our clients. Great. Now, I've done a little bit of research, right? And uh, data from UNCDAT, um, I'm sure, Hans, you know that, um, shows that the economic leakages from illicit trade create an annual drain on the global economy of 2.2 trillion US dollars, more or less, right? That's nearly 3% of the global economy. Now, that would be... Uh, in economic terms, an economy greater than Brazil, Italy, and Canada. So is it actually, you know, too optimistic to think that we could actually fight this uh, problem, Hans? I, I, I think we can, but uh, I think we need uh, a global reset on, uh, on the issue. You have three gentlemen here that uh, develop technologies that help brands fight counterfeiting and illicit trade. Yet, I think we all have to admit that we're failing miserably and that the market of secure traceability is nowhere near where it is supposed to be. And I would bet that there aren't more than 1% of the products distributed globally which are actually traceable. So a reset means that we as consumers, we need to rethink the situation brands need to adopt the idea of secure trace traceability in a completely different dimension and governments need to play a role in imposing the necessary legislation measured le legislation to adoption of secure traceability so we have to really really enforce um, regulation on different levels from the consumer up to uh, organizations governments uh, multilateral uh, institutions and so on uh, but where is now the biggest need to act uh, what do you think <clears throat> for me first of all let's say that three percent sounds probably like a big number but I'm, my expectation would be like just it's it's bigger so it's like 3% is actually good news. Uh, but uh, let's say that in illicit trade, you probably have situations. Okay, let's say that 3% is like average temperature of patients in the hospital. Yeah, so it's like it does not tell you anything. But probably there are industries, there are situations when actually illicit trade like makes them uh, like dead. Um, it's probably strange in you know, like example, but for example, in very young cannabis industry in the United States, uh, very controversial, but it's still like legal trade already like suffers from illegal trade. So it's, and then you have all the consequences that actually is like bad quality, it's danger for your health, blah, 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 a lot of, a lot of, lot of different like bad and ugly situations. Uh, so uh, I do believe that it should be like a combination of government action uh, and without government actually it's not, nothing is going to happen and technology. So technology in all cases can help enforce something. But legal environment, legal like background should be like created of course by governments. Um, Sergey, you are the CTO of uh, Intetix. Uh, now in a you know, daily 
and practical um, approach, right? Which are some of the biggest problems that you are fighting? Uh, actually, too many to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> that we, was we a deep breath. Many dimensions, and what I wanted to mention in addition is that technologies help to fight illicit trade, and they help a lot it to grow, because uh, with newest technologies, people can can do uh, as much more illicit trade uh, as they could do before. So you're fighting Goliath. I mean, it's just like a cycle. It never stops. Kind of. Yeah, good guys uh, against bad guys. Uh, like uh, it, it was uh, from antique. Yeah. So how to break this vicious cycle then? Uh, I think good guys smarter. They, <laughs> they, they will find Or maybe use more robots. Of course. Uh, newest technologies such as blockchain. Artificial intelligence, 5G, um, Internet of Things. If I, if I may, so it's like, let's say that uh, very, very like famous uh, buzzword uh, in last year that was blockchain. Since God, it's already like not uh, that like much in this year. But block blockchain is actually very, very good technology for illicit trade. So, um, and, <laughs> and but you can fight it with blockchain as well. So it's like it's both. It's like double side weapon and uh, let's say that bad guys they should be simply regulated just because again so it's like technology by itself won't solve the problem it's a tool right let me ask andrew then as the head of kudelski security could actually blockchain save uh, you know um, some of the business and maybe help um, uh, you know in this disease to fight it I agree that blockchain is the word of choice over the last few years. I, I've been in meetings where people have claimed that it'll cure cancer. Yeah. I, I don't think it'll do that. Uh, I do think theoretically, um, from an academic perspective, it's the right technology to solve this problem. It's uh, designed to solve these supply chain problems and provide transparency throughout a trade. Um, this morning I was on a panel about money laundering and how to prevent it. Blockchain makes a lot of sense there for the same reason it makes a lot of sense here. That said, the technology is just not there yet. I mean, the concepts make sense, but the applicable solutions are, are not mature. So yes, but it's gonna be a while. And to your point, um, it's also enabling the illicit trade through cryptocurrency. Uh, the, you know, the answer here is uh, faster technology development, lower cost pricing, and, and more regulation. So Now, the title of our panel is how to mobilize businesses and fight effectively. Um, Hans, would you like to answer that question, like how to use business? Let me just remind people to be a little bit quiet in the room, please, if you could be a bit quieter. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, one, one comment of what uh, Andrew just said. I, I agree with blockchain also that it, uh, um, it is something that in the future can help a lot, but sometimes I feel like we're for children that want to bypass the main meal and go directly to dessert because we found a new nice thing that we want to play with when we have not addressed the most fundamental issues in counterfeiting and illicit trade that can be addressed today. And to come back to your question, there is absolutely no reason today why medicines that are traceable and already have traceability solutions do not allow a caretaker or a patient, for example, a patient in sub-Saharan Africa, to verify the authenticity of a product before the product is administered. The technology is already there. You're not talking even about the last mile. You're talking about the last five centimeters between opening the pack and giving it to a patient. And you're talking, in the case of deaths from malaria in sub-Saharan Africa alone, 120,000 a year. And given that this is a WHO approved number, I would say that you can probably double or triple it easily. Interpol once assessed that there are one million deaths from counterfeit medicines every year. There is no reason for that to exist. There is also no reason for blockchain to solve that problem. It's a simple problem of adoption and of creating the necessary platform that allows you to verify what is already there. And then you have a problem of adoption in general. As I said, the industry of secure traceability is nowhere near where it is supposed to be. We need to create incentives to stimulate adoption of secure traceability solutions. And then, here I'm pitching a little bit what we do, create the interoperability among these solutions so that customs officers, law enforcement agents, and consumers can verify the authenticity of a product 
through regardless of the technology that has been adopted. But that is available today. We just haven't found the mechanisms to actually go, as I said, that last few centimeters and bring it to the consumer. I, I, th go ahead, I, I think that's just because it's early. I mean, there are, uh, you're right, the technology exists today, but there's been no consolidation in the market whatsoever. Um, there are hundreds of technologies available that could theoretically solve a track and trace problem with drugs in Sub-Saharan Africa, as an example. Uh, plus, there's no infrastructure for those. Um, there's no consolidated infrastructure for those solutions to run on. And then finally, there's not a lot of incentive, to your point, for the different parties to work together. Uh, so it's we're in the early stages. The good news is I think we all see the light and the solution. Just how can we accelerate the technology development and the acceptance? And why is there no incentive, maybe? Or what, what would you like to say, Hans? No, I'm just trying to say yeah. uh, I don't think there is ever going to be a single solution that resolves all of the issues. I think we're always going to deal, as we're dealing today, with dozens, if not hundreds, of viable solutions that also address problems in completely different economic viability points. So what we focus on and what we believe is important, and which is certainly not rocket science, is to create the interoperability among these solutions. They're completely in line with what you said. We're not going to solve the problem now, but the problem of creating the interoperability, that can be solved immediately. Do we not need a lot of uh, investment for that, for this uh, interoperability? Um, what do you think from Intetix? Uh, is there enough uh, money around and uh, will to invest? Uh, from my perspective, integration between solutions, again, as a technical person, I can say it's not complicated. I just we need to have a good will, indeed, of all players, and I think that uh, events like this, places like this, is uh, is something that we also need to highlight the issues we have here, and to motivate people to participate more in the illicit trade fighting. Because those who are affected, they for sure are fighting and look for solutions and implement solutions, etc. But only maybe some small percent of companies affected with it, and all others they don't care but finally it ruins budgets of countries where they operate etc so we need to, to have common effort to fight and uh, as one more time have good, you noticed have yes have you noticed a huge investment gap like you know what would actually be needed and what governments for example they want to pay for uh, again it's, it's it's hard to answer for me as engineer I think governments need at least to create conditions for us to operate in this in this area because usually sometimes corruption and laws they don't allow to implement illicit trade solutions in countries Boris uh, what's your um, view yeah so um, let's say that uh, pure businesses is a usual supply and demand in uh, let's say that interoperability of like illicit fights and systems uh, the customer is going to be only government then actually, so it's like you have uh, the only like a source of financing, it's like public funds. And here we have, unfortunately, especially in the third world, we have like a huge problem of corruption. Actually, there is no right now in the like, in all the situations, for example, with all these like uh, counterfeit drugs in, in Africa, you all the time have humans that actually corrupt. And unfortunately, so it's like without solution of this problem, again, technology is, going, is not going to help. So. Um, now, we, we have, of course, like a lot of different uh, illicit uh, trade and trafficking uh, problems. We have, we have smuggling, we have counterfeiting, we have tax evasion, we have, um, you know, we weapon smuggling. We have so much different types of uh, illicit uh, trafficking human beings and so on. Um, so how could in that case um all of that impact uh, the sdgs because we've been talking a lot on this uh, panel um during the caspian week on the sustainable development goals with you as well uh, hans i believe so is this really um, a big uh, risk for the sdgs to be achieved i think the risk is that we continue to do what we do now which is very little um I think there is a huge benefit to the sustainable development goals in bringing back, regardless which assessment is correct, but we're talking about trillions of dollars, 
if we bring these resources back into the legitimate economy, number one, but we all know that illicit trade and counterfeiting is very closely intertwined with all the other human atrocities that we have today, from modern day slavery to child labor, uh, to prosti illegal prostitution and everything else. So um, we can only gain from that, and it's somehow mind-boggling that a multi-trillion dollar issue is not even addressed in the Sustainable Development Goals. And that is where we stand today. We're really ground zero, I would say, in the fight against counterfeiting and illicit trade. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the actors, right, you touched on that, uh, who are the culprits? Like, who are the main actors? Who are the people and the networks, uh, the mafias that are responsible for all that? Is it one network or is it individual actors? Criminal investigation. It's a lot of different groups, and it depends on what it is. But I, no, it's not one group. It's lots of different groups, and it tends to be in unregulated environments. Uh, we work a lot in the anti-counterfeiting of consumables. So um, if I make some device that needs consumables in the US, there are other markets that you can make those consumables a lot cheaper. So who are your partners? Is it Interpol? Is it uh, you know the um, secret services? Um, All the above. All so, of them. So we help the, what we see is consumables made in other markets where there's less regulation, potentially made less sustainably, super, certainly made a lot cheaper, uh, impacts not only the sustainability goals of everyone involved, also impacts the bottom line of the company selling the product, ultimately affects the, affects the consumer because they're getting a lower grade product. Uh, so there's, in, in that particular market, market the, in that particular area, the incentives are all aligned. Uh, that's not necessarily the case for some of these other challenges we're talking about. Now, because you have so many different uh, clients, um, how do you think should we mobilize those clients and, and you know make them aware of all the risks a bit more and mobilize those businesses? Events like this help. I think one. Should, do, do we need like a real negative, you know, um, incident? For example, like a hacking incident uh, when we talk about you know cybersecurity, something that is really opening the eyes of those companies. I would argue it's already happening because of the 3% number we're debating. What, what's missing is solutions that uh, are mainstream. There are good ideas in development, but we're missing a standard, a framework, and a core solution to go execute it against. We're also missing all the regulation that needs to be put in place uh, to enable those technology solutions to work. And in terms of regulation, is it uh, the national governments plus the United Nations uh, plus other organizations? Who would be those responsible to come up and draft these uh, regulations? It seems like obvious. So it's again, it's the national governments first of all, and then inter international treaties. So it's like without international treaties, probably you, you still will have like a lot of a lot of violations. Um, again, the role of technology in all this like equation, so it's government is the first, it only help with law enforcement. So it's like, it's again, probably it's like even illegal for uh, technology companies to enforce something in illicit trade by their own. So like, again, it's, it's a government uh, business. Hans, uh, you would like to add something? Yes, I think, as I said at the very beginning, I think we need a, a fundamental shift in the thinking. I, I, I believe that the international organizations need to be part of the exercise, but I also believe we need to learn from, and it's not a criticism, but it's a reality. If you look, for example, at the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which among others was simply supposed to regulate tobacco and to adopt traceability uh, on tobacco products, it started 17 years ago. So in the meantime, Technologies evolved, apps didn't even exist when they started the discussions, and you end up with some sort of hybrid at the end, and this is not what we need. And we certainly don't need to waste another 17 years or 15 years of conversation and spend millions and millions of dollars in dialogue. I do believe that local um, regulators play a very important role. Governments play a very important role, and if you allow me just an alternative, today the standard is that companies, and it's certainly not to accuse anybody there, but there are a number of companies, they will simply go into a government and they will lobby the government until the government changes its legislations and adopts secure traceability on one industry sector. 
somehow you could argue that you're trying to resolve an illicit issue with illicit practices when you do that. I think it would be much easier if governments would have a change of mind and say, we simply need products across the board to be traceable. And you as a brand, you can choose the traceability of you want, that you want, and that is economically viable and practical for you, for as long as it addresses certain minimum viable security standards, and you have one year to do so, and we as the government will work on the interoperability of these solutions. If one country does that, the industries that the industry that you three gentlemen are in will be multiplied already by three. And you can imagine what happens if all the 200 and something countries do that. That's a spillover effect. Uh, what do you think about this proposal, Andrew? I think it's a good idea. I'll say it's tough. I mean, the average product life cycles are 12 to 36 months. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I see with implementing these solutions, particularly in the technology sector, is velocity. We're just moving too fast. Uh, we're trying to keep up with innovation. It makes sense that we should move that fast. Without a framework or technical specifications, it's very difficult to put these track and trace or supply chain solutions in at the end. You really need to make decisions on the front end of the product development cycle. Um, and it's just going to take time. I think we'll get there, but it's going to take time because of these product life cycles. It's very often the problem that technology is faster than regulation, isn't it? Boris, you wanted to add something. Let's say that if Tobacco Association uh, would order traceability of every cigarette pack, it's doable. It's doable right now. So, like, it's 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 it's, it's nothing nothing on technology side. It's simply like piece of work. So, like, let's do it. So, <laughs> if somebody pays, let's I, do it. I, I think no, these problems just, are good. No, no, just one comment on tobacco. Tobacco already has. I mean, I think we have somebody from tobacco here in the room from JTI or no. Please Maybe. join us afterwards Every, in the discussion. But, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there, I think I'm correct that at least the majority or every pack of cigarettes in the world already has secure traceability. Yet, nobody is capable of verifying the authenticity of a pack of cigarettes. If anybody can ask, well, but we'd understand why because of political reasons, but a logical reason why this is the case, it is simply an absurd. And it is the case also with medical products and others. I agree on the life cycle, but how about just starting with what already exists and is already there? That is already a, a, an important. And if tobacco, which sells how many trillion of products a year, three, I think, packs of cigarettes a year, more or less, if they can adopt secure traceability on their products, so can anybody else if they really want to. Absolutely. Boris. So again, so it's like it's, it's the issue of goodwill of governments and law enforcement and again all the regulators on this planet but not technology so again so it's like it's, there is good will there is good answer uh-huh good um if no one from the panel would like to add something on that point i would like to open at the q a session um please just identify yourself with your name um who you work for who you would like to ask the question to and keep your question short. That's all I would like to ask for. Belarusak of uh, high screen. Um, well, apparently, speaking of consumer products traceability, there are two industries which probably are ahead of others, tobacco and pharma. So uh, in your view, what would it take for others to actually kind of follow in their foot for footsteps? And what other categories of products you think are the next in line? Who would actually go uh, into investing into tracing their products? I, th so I think an obvious target is uh, high qual high cost goods, wines, jewelry, uh, high pre high high end foods. I mean, these are places where significant investments already underway. I've met with startups here that are doing amazing work in that space, um, but that's the most obvious next target for traceability. Just a uh, uh, sorry. The, the next targets from a government point of view are usually, I mean, if, if you look, it starts with tobacco, it continues with alcohol, and then it goes into caffeinated, uh, carbonated drinks, sugary drinks, waters. That's usually what, uh, what the governments do. Um, to add on what Andrew just said, I mean, cosmetics is a, is, a, is a huge problem. Counterfeit spare parts is a huge problem. So there, there is just a combination of brands stopping to wait because 
I wouldn't say rightly so, but it's also understandable if they wait to adopt a traceability solution, knowing that tomorrow somebody might impose a traceability solution on them. So we're, we're kind of, through the current practices, we're killing the traceability adoption uh, rate. I think there is that shift that needs to happen. But I think that there are many industry sectors, baby food and others. I mean, there are examples in China of deaths of children from fake baby food. I mean, we all know, might know the stories where in one week, hundreds of uh, toddlers, babies die because of fake uh, 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 milk formula. So we have, I mean, you mentioned it before. I mean, does something need to happen? Wow, we do have a million deaths every single year. So it's happening every day. We did have all of the stories. We're just not ready to move yet. Boris? Um, like two notes. Uh, back in the 90s, at the time of collapse of the Soviet Union and my native Belarus, I knew a guy who actually produced and uh, sold uh, any kind of labels. You need Armani? No problem. So it's going to be Armani in five minutes. I want the Gucci <laughs> bag, please. So, but uh, the second note is probably more important. Uh, very good subject is actually sanctions enforcement. You have a lot of, for example, illegal trade with oil. Let's trace it. What I, want, yeah, what I wanted to add is, is of course, uh, people here mentioned that illicit trade like, uh, that uh, pushes people to, to, to die. And that's, of course, first of all, things that need to be sold. But I, I, again, because I'm a software developer, etc., I want also to mention media content and digital content that also is, is a huge area that we need to protect and to be protecting. Uh, we have markets like Apple Store, etc. It's now we are more protected, but still there are media content owners. They lose, I don't know, huge amount of money. And uh, we also need to protect them somehow. Is there any estimate uh, in terms of uh, uh, loss, uh, uh, profit loss uh, of a company, of a business on average, if they don't do anything? Is there some kind of an estimate? On a global scale, probably not. It's very difficult to come up with an estimate. Okay, but still better to protect than not to do anything. Huh? It's like uh, in the cybersecurity world as well. Mm -hmm. Hans, you would like to add something? Yeah, just. The estimates you can you, you I don't have the number in my head but you can calculate it but the problem is what is our what is our level of acceptance for collateral damage and I I believe we're at that edge right now because if you take the highest estimate of 4.2 trillion the GDP of Germany as I mentioned earlier and if you take the number of deaths and the impact that counterfeiting is having on on our social and economic lives that should not be considered collateral damage anymore. It's like wiping out Germany as an economy and saying that this is a collateral damage of, of, of globalization. That Angela is not Merkel we can today would not be happy. She would leave Davos today, um, which she plans, I think, anyways. But um, any more comment? Uh, more questions, please, from the floor? Is anybody else involved in uh, this issue with your companies or businesses or might need some tips? The all victims. <laughs> but maybe somebody has a case example. Not really. Okay. Um, so going forward, um, what is your top advice for a business? Um, who wants to start? I, I From start. a technical uh, point of view. Actually, every business that starts uh, some deals with us receives recommendations how to protect themselves in cyber uh, area because we do cyber things. And uh, yeah, we say, guys, you need to be protected. And uh, most of the companies, they don't care about security until they hacked, as you mentioned it, or until they attacked, then immediately they start care. And, and say, then guys, it's too late. Yeah, sometimes it's too late, sometimes it's on time, we can save something, but uh, mostly now we, we show them these cases and say, look, this was happened to us maybe in the past, this would happen to our clients, do you want to be in this list or you want to receive good protection? So we do this. That's a good marketing strategy because then you actually open the eyes of uh, potential victims and actually, then they cash in. Actually, in our practice, actually, we offer our clients so-called triple legal protection for the intellectual property. So it's like a very important for especially startup companies just because, again, so it's like you're protected on the legal side. 
Uh, and the second one, when they start successful operations, then it's like security concerns. So like, and again, in, in, in programming and software development itself, there are special practices how to make the product secure, to protect it again, from illicit trade in like large, <laughs> big sense. I would say have a plan or plan to fail. So some very small decisions early in the design process of products and materials can make a huge difference versus making the decisions after a breach or after a major incidents where, you know, we've seen studies that are it's 10 or a thousand, potentially a thousand times more expensive to make the changes that you need to make. So, so at Codell's key security, um, which kind of key, you know, uh, developments uh, are you seeing? What kind of initiatives, new programs are you launching in that regard? It's a, you know, we're a technical company, engineering firm, and we often work with uh, organizations that are building products to do the right things around things like key management, auditing, authenticity, identity. These are key concepts when trying to uniquely identify a product and track it throughout the supply chain. You want to go do something cool with blockchain? That's great. You need identity. You need key storage. You got to be able to do these things right. Uh, and again, doing them in the day one of the product life cycle is a thousand times cheaper than doing it in day n of the product life cycle. Boris? Just one remark, very good number. Preventing of a bug is 10 times cheaper than fixing a bug. Oh my goodness. So. <laughs> yeah, I think it's clear. Hans? Yeah, yeah I, I, just to add to what um, Andrew said, I think, I think security and product traceability needs to be integral part of product design. And uh, I just want to tell you a little story from one of the world's major brands. When I had a discussion a few years back now on why they don't adopt secure traceability, although they have been victims of some very large issues, including deaths of uh, um, um, of humans. Um, the excuse was that the marketing department sees that as a risk because if we tell our customers that we need to add secure traceability on our products, they might now think, almost like in reverse psychology, that our products aren't safe. And I think brands, it's a true story. Brands need to move on from that mentality and accept that a safer product is a better product and that you can build a very strong marketing dimension on that solution as opposed to see it as a liability. Exactly, because we always think that the uh, disaster hits our neighbor, like we could never have cancer or HIV AIDS or something like that, right? But we can use it as a marketing tool, as a PR strategy. I mean, that's um, a brilliant idea. Do you use that at uh, Intetix already? Or maybe to, for your to, clients? To, to some extent. So it's like it's, uh, you know, we actually we develop software for others and actually again it could be different situations with our clients and with their policies so sometimes again so it's like it's exactly like like we do have such situations unfortunately uh -huh. um from a you know business perspective for yourselves um where do you see the biggest um markets uh is it in eastern europe where you operate from is it uh, more asia the us europe uh, where does the biggest uh, business growth come from it's worldwide and uh, at kudelsky security you also see growth coming from everywhere right right um are there now more questions from the floor Not right now. Nobody wants to share a nightmare scenario. Is there any key takeaway for you? Anything that you would like um, to comment on as a final remark, Andrew? I'll just say that this problem is uh, very much like a lot of cybersecurity problems in that there aren't a lot of good answers. I mean, there's no easy solution. Everything involves spending money, working harder earlier, uh, and then working with uh, to increase and improve regulation. And I, and I should say on the regulation comment, uh, it's, we're not looking for bad regulation here. Or frankly, what makes the regulation topic tough, uh, particularly around these trade issues and uh, cross-border issues, is when the regulation differs. So country to country, state to state. So smart regulation, more investment, smarter decision-making earlier 
uh, is really the solution, much like many cybersecurity problems. And as we're approaching the last uh, day of the World Economic Forum tomorrow, uh, you've mentioned startups, Andrew. Have you identified potential partners? Uh, what are you looking for in potential partners? Maybe there's somebody in the room who would like to talk to you later. We're always looking for partners. Uh, we've met dozens of very interesting companies here at Davos, and uh, the speed of innovation is really unbelievable. I mean, what's being done, particularly in this space, track and trace, uh, is unbelievable uh, around physical products and how the blockchain is being used and uh, how physical products are being tagged and tracked and learned a lot about diamonds this week and how those work. So it's, uh, it's a, there's a lot of innovation going on. For you at Intetix, has it been a successful web um, in terms of you know partnerships and opportunities? And what are you looking for? Yes, it was, and it is. It continued to be. Uh, yeah, we, we by the way we sponsor. We are sponsors of Caspian Week. Uh, one of the reasons because this area of Caspian uh, areas in general in the world that are developing fast now are very interesting for us because uh, they have really challenging projects. Uh, challenging solutions. Uh, if, if you compare them to Europe and East West world, it's like more, more or less set and done, and uh, change uh, happens there slowly. While here we may find uh, very complicated and very interesting for our engineers, smart brains uh, solutions. So. Uh, yeah, it was nice. Boris, as you have been in this uh, business for a long time, uh, what is uh, the biggest worry that you have uh, going forward in terms of illicit trafficking and trade? Uh, I probably agree that actually so it's like it's the area of regulations and they could be smart and help everybody. But unfortunately, very often they could be just like quite opposite. And then it's actually like... Um, like Again, so it's like prevent any kind of innovation, any kind of like moving forward. Again, so like it's uh, probably does not help, but it's like desire of a smarter world. <laughs> Hans, uh, some closing remarks that you might have? No, I just like to repeat that. Uh, let's not forget to resolve the issues that we can resolve with the technologies that we already have, and then evolve from there, as opposed to constantly looking for what is in the in, in the horizon which is a very convenient and and easy way out of the problems that we face every single day the last thing i wanted to add is just thank our host uh for a wonderful week and uh, for what they have organized here and uh, this whole week and a really great program that mm -hmm. i've been had the pleasure to participate in thank you to close i would just like to have a uh, you know temperature of the room or just see who is worried about um, illicit trade because most of you have some kind of business or are you know involved uh, with companies so who is scared of illicit trade for your own business hands up not too many okay maybe four or five hands six yeah the others are pretty cool all right thank you so much for our panelists